you just love this? Seriously, do you remember that scene in When Harry Met Sally when he tells her that he loves her for the first time on New Year's Eve? Or in Titanic when they're on the bow of the boat and my heart will go on is in the background? We just love these moments, don't we? And partly, it's because that's how we learn about love, through these movie magic moments. But that's not real. Real love, things are confusing, they're awkward. Real love, when it's dramatic, it's not really a, ba a good thing. It's a bad thing, right? And if you think about it, what makes this so amazing, what makes us feel so good when we watch these movies is technology. It's the steady cam that circles the couple, that makes you feel like you're just right there for their first kiss. Or it's that perfect green screen background that's created that makes them feel like they're in the exact right environment to fall in love. When real love sometimes happens at a crowded bar and you're smashed up against one another. And in real life, sometimes that first kiss of the steady cam, you're smashing teeth and <laughs> it's not the most romantic moment. Because real life is a little different than the movies. In technology today, though, it, it plays such a big part in our lives. Um, probably even a larger thing than you think. I know we all have our phones within reach all the time, but it's bigger too. There's data on our lives. According to Eric Schmidt, who's the former CEO of Google, the data generated in the next 48 hours will actually be more than the data generated from the dawn of humankind to 2003. Technology is so powerful. And so is love, though. So it's time for us to redefine the definition, redefine the relationship between love and technology. And when I think about what redefined it for me, what made love not so confusing, what made love real, it's my mom. She was my greatest teacher in what real love was. She had me when she was 17, a teen mom way before MTV's 16 and Pregnant ever existed, before that was a thing, before it was accepted to be a single mother. We lived in this small town, and it was hard for her. My biological father actually proposed which to most teen moms would be the most exciting thing. It could mean she would be able to start a family. She wouldn't have to go it alone. She wouldn't have to grow up so fast by herself. But she decided to say no. She declined his proposal because she didn't love him. And she wanted to feel that love at 17. It was something that she prioritized in her life. And she found it. She met Rob right around the time I was born. And I got to watch their love story unfold my entire life. It happened in the backyard, at the kitchen table. So while other girls were learning about love from watching Disney princess movies, I got to watch my own mother fall head over heels have that, those moments that make us feel good in movies, they felt good in real life for me. And I had to learn how to love a man too because Rob wasn't my biological father. We had dinner dates. He would cook hot dogs for me, which was basically the only thing he knew how to make. And we even went to the movies too. He took me to my first movie, The Jungle Book, dinner and a movie. And that was something that became such a part of my life also, learning how to love someone else who wasn't your parent so young. And now, when I was six, Rob proposed to my mom, and she said yes. She chose that moment. She chose that man. And 
They walked down the aisle together. I was their flower girl. And I got to see how a real love story forms. And when they returned from their honeymoon, Rob adopted me, filling that void that was left in my life and on my birth certificate for so many years. Rob taught me about love through experiencing it, because that's how we learn about love. And my mom taught me about love through prioritizing it and the way she approached it. The love lessons I learned so young were a central and essential part of my life. And now, that's what I do. I'm the founder of eFlirt, an online dating consultancy. We're a personal branding service that helps people meet online and fall in love offline. I'm the author of Love at First Click, The Ultimate Guide to Online Dating, and I've given advice to more than 500 media outlets. But the reason why I wake up every day is because my company has helped thousands of people one-on-one -on -one find love online to navigate the transition of technology and real life. In fact, it's the whole reason I'm here today, because I help someone in this very room find love online. I help people navigate the next generation of love. It's the marriage of technology and relationships. And I love to think about the future and how technology is impacting relationships today, but there's something that will never change. We can text hello, but we can't type our own happily ever after. We don't know where our love story is going to go. We don't know who our leading lady or our leading man will be. If my mom were to write her own love story the year before I was born, I probably wouldn't have even been part of that. And Rob may have been a totally different guy. Online dating gives us this sense of control in our love lives. It makes us feel like we can choose the exact age, height, eye color, even alma mater of who we want to date. But that's not reality. We, we don't know who that person is going to be yet. And I focus on selection because I find that this is what matters most with online dating. We help people write their profiles and pick their photos, and that's important too. But even if you have the perfect profile, the perfect photos, if you're choosing the wrong person, you're never going to meet the right one. So when you're thinking about dating online, think about who you're picking more than how you're approaching it. We have this service where we actually will search for singles. And with this service, more than 50% of our clients who have used that service are in relationships after working with us. We track the data of their love lives. When we send them a match, we ask them to respond, yay, nay, or maybe. And we track that and how their relationships evolve with those people. And the most interesting thing, though, is that Almost everyone who is in a relationship now are with people that they only initially said maybe to. It wasn't the person who they said, yes, that's the perfect person for me when they saw their profile. Instead, it was someone who they thought, mm, I don't know, I'm not really sure. Maybe isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just not who you thought. It's not what you thought. But especially online, our gut isn't always right. And we don't know what goes into our gut, though, until someone challenges it. And in some of those cases, I actually had to say to my client, are you sure that they should be a nay and not a maybe? Because it's only the maybes that our clients fall in love with. It's only the maybes that have the potential for more. It's only the maybes that you can get unscripted with. So that's what I want to teach you today, is how to find the maybes for yourself.
the first thing is to put it in neutral. Because let me tell you, on Match.com, on Sunday night from 8 to 9 o'clock, that's their highest traffic time of the entire week. And most online dating sites trend this way also. It's Sunday night. So when I ask singles why they date online on Sunday night, they tell me it's because it's when they feel worst about their love life. They've had bad dates or they've had no dates that weekend. They feel lonely. They feel hopeless. They are resolute. They are going to change their love life by the next time the weekend rolls around. But it's the worst time to date online because you're so emotionally involved in every decision you make. You're really invested. You're trying too hard. So the best time to date online is actually when you feel neutral. Maybe it's over your morning coffee. A time when you don't feel as tied to the outcome. When you're not trying. When you're not overanalyzing. The second thing is to review who you view. Most of my clients are really looking for love. And I find that then when this is the case, the way they look at a profile is they say, is that going to be my next soulmate? Will that be my next relationship? But nobody knows from looking at a profile if someone is going to be their next relationship. It's just not realistic. You don't find that out until you get offline. So the better question to ask yourself is, are they worth a margarita? Because if they're worth a margarita, they're worth a message, and they're worth meeting up and seeing what possibility exists. Soulmates come later. You'll determine that soon enough. And then you need to go slow to find your maybes. Don't get too hot and heavy with online dating so fast. We live in this swipe-based society now, right? We swipe left, we swipe right. We're making split-second decisions. But when you do that, you're actually not making conscious decisions. And if you're looking for love, conscious decisions are the most important thing you can do for your heart. So it's actually better to go slow when you're looking through profiles. And they've also done a psychological study on searching. And it was done in 2012 by the lead researcher Eli Finkel from Northwestern University. And something that they found when they studied online, dating, online daters' behaviors is that when you, the longer you search, the more judgmental you become. So you also want to keep your search sessions short. 20 minutes, that's about max. And then the last thing and the most important thing is to challenge yourself. Challenge your heart. Challenge your why. Just like I tell my clients to say yay, nay, or maybe, you can do the same thing. Say it out loud at the computer, which is going to feel a little awkward, but trust me, it works. Because when you say it out loud, you take ownership of the decision you're making on that person. And then ask yourself, why? If it's a yay, and the reason why is because he's hot, maybe he's really a maybe. Or if he's a nay, but you're not really sure why, maybe you should make him a maybe too. And even if asking yourself why doesn't change your answer, you will learn so much about yourself, about your love life, about the decisions that you're making. And that's really what all of this is about. You have to evolve. If you do this, you will change the relationship between love and technology in your life. Some people want to run away from technology in their love lives. But I actually met my husband on Twitter, and I can tell you that meeting online is quite romantic. <laughs> I was searching a hashtag, and I was looking through the list of people, and I thought he was handsome, so I clicked on him. And then his Twitter stream just totally pulled me in. I felt like 
I need to know this guy. So I retweeted something he said to catch his attention. And then we tweeted a little back and forth. I direct messaged him and asked him out. And now five years later, we just got married this year. And the coolest thing about our relationship is that we have all the data on love and what that means to us. We can tell when we tweeted each other a sweet nothing, when we took a picture on Instagram, we have all of these digital moments that we're going to be able to share with our family, that we can share with each other when we need to remind each other how much we love each other. It's incredibly romantic. It just takes changing your perspective so that you can write your own happily ever after, or as Thomas and I like to call it, our hashtag happily ever Edwards. <laughs> Thank you.